Well, welcome to St. Peter's Online. We're so glad that you're with us today. My name is Xavier, and whether you know Jesus or not, or whether you're just here investigating things or interested, warm welcome to you. In a moment, you will hear the Bible read and then explain. We firmly believe here at St. Peter's that God speaks to us today through His life-giving Word. And my prayer is this will help you to know Him or to know Him better. Enjoy following along. Morning, family. Our reading is from Numbers chapter 9, beginning at verse 15. And the heading is, The Cloud Above the Tabernacle. On the day of the tabernacle, the tent of the, the testimony was set up, the cloud covered it. From evening till morning, the cloud above the, t- the tabernacle looked like fire. That, that is how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night, it looked like fire. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, the Israelites set out. Wherever the cloud settled, the Israelites encamped. At the Lord's command, the Israelites set out, and at his command, they encamped. As long as the cloud stayed over the tabernacle, they remained in camp. When the cloud remained over the tabernacle a long time, the Israelites obeyed the Lord's order and did not set out. Sometimes the cloud was over the tabernacle only a few days. At the Lord's command, they would encamp, and then at his command, they would set out. Sometimes the cloud stayed over from evening till morning, and when it lifted in the morning, they set out. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud lifted, they set out. Whether the cloud stayed over the tabernacle two days, or a month, or a year, the Israelites would remain in the camp and not set out, but when it lifted, they would set out. At the Lord's command, they encamped, and at the Lord's command, they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. The Lord uh, said to Moses, make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for um, calling the the community together and for uh, for the camp set out. When both are sounded, the whole community is to assemble before you at the entrance of the tent of meeting. If only one is sounded, the leaders, the, he- the heads of the clans of Israel, are to assemble before you. When the trumpet blast is sounded, the tribes camping on the, the east are to set out. At the sounding of the second blast, the, the, camp, uh, uh, the camps on the south are to set out. At the, uh, the blast will be a signal for setting out. And t- to gather the, the assembly, blow the trumpets, but not with the same signal. The sons of Aaron, uh, the, the chief, the sons of Aaron, the priests, are to blow the trumpets. This is to be a lasting ordinance for you and the generations to come. When you go into, the, into battle in your, your own land, against the enemies who are oppressing you, sound the blast of the trumpets. Then you will be remembered by the, by the Lord your God and rescued from your enemies. Also, at your times of rejoicing, your appointed feasts and new moon festivals, you are to sound the, the trumpets over the burnt offerings and the fellowship offerings, and they will be a memorial to you before your God. I am the Lord your God. On the 20th day of the second month, the second year, the cloud lifted from uh, above the tabernacle of the testimony. Then the the Israelites set out from the the desert of Sinai and traveled uh, from the place, place to place until the cloud came to rest in the desert of Paran. They set out this first time at the Lord's command through Moses. The reading continues in, on verse 33. So they set out from the mountain of the Lord and travelled for three days. The ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them to, during this, those three days to find them a place to rest. The cloud of the Lord was over them by day and when, uh, when they set out from the camp. Whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, O Lord, May your enemies be scattered. May your foes flee before you. And whenever it came to rest, they said, 
Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, New Testament reading this morning is from John's Gospel, chapter 10, and starting at the first verse. Jesus is speaking and says, Very truly I tell you, Pharisees, anyone who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in some other way, is a thief and a robber. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognise a stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore Jesus said again, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate of the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep will not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hard hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hard hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They will too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This is the command I received from my Father. This also is the word of the Lord. Uh, when I was young and arrogant, <laughs> yep, <laughs> there was a time when I didn't want to be guided by anyone and it almost ended in disaster. Uh, my brother and I, uh, my brother in law and I, we were into all sorts of kind of activities and we decided one day we would take up abseiling. We thought, oh, that'll be a hoot. And so we went to the shop and we bought the, you know, the ropes and the carabiners and all those kind of things. And the, the experts in the shop said, you should get some guidance on this. But we just went and figured it out ourselves. We started on small cliffs and then we got a bit bolder and went to bigger ones. And then we brought, bought a longer rope to do Mount Victoria, 240 feet. It was getting pretty sketchy. And then we went abseiling off uh, North Head, which is a smaller cliff, but with my sister this time. And her hair got caught in the rope. We cut the rope to try to rescue her. I got stranded on the cliff. There was helicopters, patrol boats with the lights, a rescue team. It could have ended in disaster. All because we didn't seek guidance. <laughs> we didn't seek expert guidance. Getting guidance is recommended, isn't it? <laughs> for some things in life. Today we're going to be thinking about the greatest area where we need guidance in, that is life itself. That's a big topic, isn't it? When you think about life, it's kind of like a journey in some ways. Uh, and at various times in life, it's helpful to have guidance for different things. 
Now, we all take different paths in life, don't we? <laughs> um, some of you might be walking like my young, arrogant self, making it up as you go. <laughs> Others might be feeling like, oh, I'm at a crossroads. I've got this decision that I need to make. And having a bit of guidance might be helpful. Others of us might feel like we're in a rut. It's Groundhog Day. We're just doing the same thing. And I need a sea change. Maybe I need guidance to help to change. Others of us might be going, oh, I'm sick of making decisions all the time. <laughs> in life. I just wish somebody would tell me the next thing I need to do. Uh, at various times in life, it's good to have guidance. Sometimes we need guidance. Uh, here at St. Peter's, we believe the Lord is the best guide for life. And so we're going to dip into this big subject today of God's guidance. We're just going to scratch the surface. And we're doing this because as we've been reading through the book of Numbers, uh, if you're here for the very first time, we've been just reading through the book of Numbers. We've been here for four weeks. God's people have pretty much been plonked in the same place in the wilderness for a year. God is preparing them for a journey. And guess what? Finally today... <laughs> The journey begins as we read through this book. And we'll see that God's people, they don't guide themselves. They are guided by the Lord of life. And this is going to help us to reflect on God's guidance for your life, for my life. I wonder if that's something that you look out for, that's something that you seek. Do you seek the Lord's guidance in your life? And do you ask the question, where is he guiding me or how does he guide me? Those are the kind of things we're going to be thinking about this morning. So we're going to reflect first of all on how God guided his people of old and uh, their response to that and then that, that's going to help us here today in Tamworth. Now we need to remember that God's people are around about 2 million. Now, that's a lot of people, isn't it? Encamped in the wilderness of Sinai. If you were to shift that mass of humanity <laughs> and take them to the promised land, just think about the logistics of that. How would you do it? <laughs> it's incredible. Well, God did it through two main methods. Through a cloud, which was over that special tent, the tabernacle, and through two silver trumpets that were blown. So let's consider God guiding them by the cloud, first of all. Have you got your Bibles there? Chapter 9. Share it with the person beside you if you haven't got a Bible. Chapter 9, verse 15, and I'll read a little bit of that. Chapter 9, verse 15. On the day the tabernacle, that's that special tent, the, the tent of the covenant law was set up, the cloud covered it. This is the cloud from God covered it. From evening till morning... The cloud above the tabernacle looked like fire, so it glowed at night time. <laughs> That's how it continued to be. The cloud covered it, and at night it looked like fire. And whenever the cloud lifted from above the tent, that was a signal. What was the signal for? Time to set out. Can you imagine that? Imagine if you're part of this great mass of humanity, this, this huge group of people, what would that have been like? You see the cloud go up? Oh, okay. Time to pack up, roll up the sleeping bags, get the kids dressed, put their sandals on, pack up the tents, send the oldest kid out to round up the cattle, stick granny on the donkey, <laughs> and... <laughs> And the Levites would start packing up the special tent, the tabernacle. I mean, this makes getting to church with kids on a Sunday seem like kids, kids play, doesn't it? Would that be exciting? I guess it would be. I don't know if you'd like to be part of all that. Do you like camping? This was the Israelites. And then when the cloud settled, what did the Israelites have to do? Set up camp again. They had to stay. So up goes the tent, roll out the sleeping bags, find some water for the flocks. The Levites would be busy setting up the tabernacle and Granny would be on the carpet nursing her hips from the, <laughs> from the donkey ride, right? <laughs> That's how they moved. That's how they were guided by God, by this cloud, going up and going down and going before them. And sometimes they're in one place for one night and then they had to get up and go the next day. 
Sometimes they'd stay a few days, sometimes a month. They just had to keep an eye on the, the cloud. Added to this were trumpets. Uh, have a look at chapter 10, verse 1 to 2. The Lord said to Moses, make two trumpets of hammered silver and use them for calling the community together and having the camps set out. So you have trumpets. <laughs> Very loud. I mean, this makes sense, doesn't it? This is a pre-electronic era. You didn't have radio, you didn't have WhatsApp or any of those electronic devices. This was a very effective way of communicating. And so the priest who's near the tabernacle, he sees the cloud going up and what does he do? He blows the trumpet, you're in your tent. You're having a nap from yesterday. You did 15,000 steps yesterday. <laughs> and then you hear the trumpet. You go, oh, okay, <laughs> we're off again. <laughs> and so up you go. Now, sometimes these trumpets were also used for gathering leaders together, or they would be used for times of war or announcing a festival. So that's how it happened. God guided them as a nation, this mass of humanity, to the promised land through a cloud going up and down and going before them and through these trumpets that were blown. Well, let's reflect a little bit on this before we come to ourselves here at Tamworth, before we try to apply it to our lives. A few things to notice. First thing to notice is that God's guidance was very clear. There was no confusion, was there, <laughs> about what to do. It was clear. Second thing to note out of this passage is that God is presented as a commander amongst his people. He's like a general moving an army. Seven times it's mentioned, at the command of the Lord, at the command of the Lord, at the, they headed out, they, they followed his leading. The third thing to note is that this could have been challenging, don't you think? <laughs> Being guided by the Lord wasn't always going to be easy. Can you imagine staying one night in the camp and then the next day you have to move? Get Granny back up on the donkey? <laughs> It would have been both an exciting time and a testing time following God's guidance. And the fourth thing being underlined in this passage is that they obeyed, at least for the time being. Uh, maybe they didn't always know why. They had to stay in one place for one day and then another place for seven days, but they obeyed the Lord's command. And the idea of this passage is very clear, isn't it? God guided his people to the promised land and they obeyed him. So in chapter 10, verse 11, have a look at chapter 10, verse 11. We are finally on the move <laughs> in this book. Chapter 10, verse 11, in the second year, on the second month, on the 20th day of the month, the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle and the people set out in stages and they came to the wilderness of Paran. Finally, we're on the move. <laughs> Isn't that great? I'm excited. Are you excited? to go on the journey. I am. The journey's exciting, isn't it? And so in the next few weeks, we're going to journey with God's people of old, and we're going to see what happens. Well, us here in Tamworth, what are we to do with this? Well, when you think about the Israelites, they were disciples, really, because what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower. <laughs> That's what a disciple is. They follow. And all this is foreshadowing a much greater journey that the disciples of the Lord Jesus make today. Jesus said to find life, to find eternal life, to enter the new creation, you have to follow him, don't you? And it's not always going to be easy. Jesus actually said this, I'll put it up here on the screen for you. Whoever wants to be my disciple, in other words, to be guided my, by me, to follow me to the new creation, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. And so Jesus says, you want to take the journey to life? Then you need to renounce your own self-rule. 
your own self-guidance. You have to say no to your own self-direction in life. You have to let go of the steering wheel, so to speak, and you have to ride shotgun with Jesus as commander. You have to be different to my arrogant young self where I didn't want to be guided by anyone. You have to accept to be guided by the Lord. Now, the path won't always be easy. It will be testing at times. And this helps us, I think, to have right expectations in being a disciple. If we think, you know, some people think, by following the Lord, it will lead me to absolute happiness, complete fulfilment and raging success in this life, you know, to living the dream in this life. Uh, that's wrong expectations. That's the pros prosperity gospel. <laughs> because the Lord is leading you home. He's leading you through the wilderness of this life with, you know, brokenness and sin and so forth. And the path will sometimes be hard, it like it was for the Israelites. We have to have our expectations right. And so the first step on this path requires humility. That's what it requires. Lord, I'm going to trust you with my life and I'm going to follow you, come what may. Um, I wonder whether you are a disciple. Are you a follower of the Lord Jesus? Have you put your life into his hands? You know, the good shepherd who died for you and say, I'm going to follow you as my shepherd. Um, you won't go to the new creation, eternal life, if you don't do that. Um, you can trust him because he loves you. He laid down his life for you. If you're not sure whether you're a disciple of the Lord Jesus yet, love to chat to you about that. You can even make the decision today and say, Lord, I want you to be my shepherd. I want you to lead me. But you know, once you have done that, you've embarked on an exciting and sometimes challenging journey. And you might go, well, Lord, you're leading my life now. Where are you leading me to? And how are you leading me? You know, where are you going to take me the next five or ten years of my life? How am I supposed to know where you want me to go? So let's think about the where and let's think about how. Okay, where is God, the Lord leading us and how is he going to lead us there? The where. We've already talked about the where a little bit, haven't we? He's leading us to a wonderful new creation, to a physical new creation. That's the where, uh, to heaven. But it's more than that. He's also leading you on a path. He's leading you on a path to become like Christ along the way. Uh, that's the great destination for every disciple. He's transforming us little bit by little bit to become more like Jesus in character. So where God is leading us to has two aspects. There's a kind of this new physical dimension of this new creation after we die or when the Lord Jesus returns. But it's also leading us to become more like Jesus. And when you lock those things into your mind, it helps you to be guided by him. Uh, you can ask, you know, when you're faced with a decision that you have to make, and you know, well, God is trying to, is seeking to transform me more into Christ's likeness. You can ask yourself the question, okay, what would Christ do in this situation? What would Jesus do? You know, sometimes people wear those bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Now, that's really helpful in interpersonal relationships. How should I treat this person? What would Jesus do? That gives us a lot of guidance. But it doesn't always help us because there are some decisions in life like, should I live in Tamworth or should I live in Newcastle? What would Jesus do? Tamworth, of course, no. <laughs> it's not so easy to work out, is it? Or what, what does God want me to do the next five years or ten years of my life? What would Jesus do? I don't know. So how do we work that out? Should we be looking for clouds? that we're to follow, <laughs> or listening out for trumpets, or looking for visions, or putting out fleeces, or looking for open doors. <laughs> How do you figure it out? I'm just going to put up a stark comment, statement here. Uh, it's from a little book called Guidance and the Voice of God. I think it's a true statement. I think it can be backed up from the Bible. I'm just going to put it up here for us to reflect on. How is God guiding us today? Here's the statement, okay? Uh, oops, there. 
apart from God's Spirit, so God guides us by His Spirit, through the Bible, as we read the Bible, God doesn't promise to guide us in any other way, nor should we expect Him to. Let me just read that again. Apart from God's Spirit, through the Bible, God doesn't promise to guide you in any other way, nor should you expect Him to. In other words, God promises to guide you today through the Scriptures, through the Bible, and that's all you need. It's all you need to be guided. Let me go back, let me show you this from the Bible. 2 Timothy 3. It says, All Scripture, this is the Bible, is God-breathed, comes from Him, He's the author, and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God, or the disciple, may be thoroughly equipped. They're the words I want to underline. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you're thoroughly equipped, you've got everything, haven't you? You've got everything you need. Now imagine you're being guided through the Himalayas, okay? Wouldn't that be lovely? And you've got the most experienced Sherpa guide of the whole mountain uh, of the Himalayas. <laughs> That'd be great. If somebody came up to you and said, here's a map, you say, I don't need the map, I've got the Sherpa. If somebody says, get this app on your phone, you don't need the app. Why? Because you've got the, you've got the Sherpa. When we go back to that reading here, what Paul is basically saying is you have the Sherpa that you need. That's all you need. The only guide that you need. The Lord has given you everything you need to follow his leading. Now, of course, this doesn't stop God guiding us in other ways. He can guide through a vision or a dream, but the point is we don't have to go looking for that. We don't have to go expecting that. Now, I realise this opens up a big subject for us and a whole lot of questions. And you might like say to me, Xavier, well, when I read the Bible, it doesn't tell me whether I should live in Tamworth or Newcastle. It doesn't even mention those places. Uh, I'm agonising over that one. Well, don't agonise, just choose Tamworth. No. <laughs> How do you work that out? Well, let's reflect briefly on this. When you read the scriptures, the Bible, the Lord gives you very clear guidance on things that matter, things that matter to him. And there are things of right and wrong, um, and they matter a great deal to God, moral issues. You know, an example, no stealing. That's not hard to understand, is it? <laughs> That's like a cloud, isn't it? Or like a trumpet. You simply obey. Nothing to get confused about. But you say, well, Xavier, I wasn't going to steal a house in T Newcastle or Tamworth. How does that help me decide? Well, this is where God's word also gives us principles. Principles that we can apply, principles that help us to get guidance. Uh, just imagine you're trying to decide between Newcastle or Tamworth. What would be some of the principles from God's word that we would uh, bring to bear on deciding? Well, maybe one like Jesus said, seek my kingdom first. You could throw that into the mix. I might be going, well, I want to go to Newcastle because I'm seeking success and fame. And straight away, what do you do with that? You go, actually, that's not a good reason to go to Newcastle, is it? That's not what the Lord's guiding me to do. Or you might go to Newcastle to support a ministry in a part of town where there's not much gospel witness. That would be a great reason to go. Why? Because God wants his gospel to go out. That would be a good reason. Or you might go to New, go, decide to go to Newcastle to support your ageing parents because there's nobody else down there. Is that a good reason? Yes, it is. Because the Bible gives you guidance and tells you we ought to care for our family, an ageing family. Or you might be going to Newcastle simply because you want to change your scenery. You're bored with Tamworth. Is that a good reason to go? Well, the Bible tells you, well, what about relationships? That's at the very heart of his purposes. What about serving in a church? That's at the very heart of his purpose. You see how the Bible gives you a whole stack of principles that you can use to think about the decision you're going to make. So there's right and wrong. There are principles that the Bible gives us, and we've got to think about those. But there's also matters of complete indifference. You're at Coles, for instance, 
and you've got to buy a toothpaste. What is the Lord's guidance for me on the toothpaste? Don't worry about it. It does not matter. Just choose one, okay? So how do you think here at St Peter's we can develop amongst ourselves a good culture of guidance where we help each other to follow the Lord's leading? How can we do that? I think we do it through developing good spiritual muscle memory. Good spiritual muscle memory. Um, Let me illustrate this through a climbing metaphor. Um, Rock climbers try to find a pathway to the top of a cliff, don't they? That's what they do. And very keen rock climbers sometimes work on a route for weeks, months, even years to complete it. They they see it as a problem and they try to solve it and working out where you put your hands and so forth. And the best rock climbers in the world, people like Adam Ondra, they will come to a route that somebody took four years to solve and complete. They'll come to it, they'll look at it, and they'll flash it. You don't know, flash is language for rock climbers to say. They just look at it and they do it in one go. And all the rock climbers in the world, they look at somebody like Adam Ondra and they go, how in the world did he ever do that? How did he ever make all the right decisions and put his hand and his feet in the right place so that he made it to the... It took me four years to do that thing. How did he do it? He's been doing it since he's been a kid. Been climbing this, that and the other over and over again so that up in his head he has all this knowledge stored up and so when he comes to a decision to make, he's just been so practised at it, he tends to make the right decisions along the way. It all comes from the muscle memory locked away in his mind. And that's how God leads us today, through spiritual muscle memory. So so the more as a church family we grapple with God's word and think about it, the more we have husbands who lead their families to pray and reflect on the scriptures, the more we have mums who grapple with the Bible and teach their children, the more we have people in growth groups understanding God's word, the more we have people meeting up one-to-one and reading the Bible together, the more we dig in, the more we build up this kind of muscle memory so that when we come to make a decision in life, we bring in all these principles and we go, yes, this seems to be the wise way to go. The Lord is leading us. And so as we grow as a church, we'll be able to help each other point each other to right and wrong, point each other to principles. You go, I'm trying to make a decision on this. Had you thought about that? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. I better consider that. That is the way the Lord leads us today, through his word. Now, I realise this is a big subject. You may have lots of questions. You may be not thinking about going to Newcastle, but there might be other decisions you want to make in life. Can I recommend to you um, these two books? Guidance and the Voice of God has just got a different cover there. We're selling them up the back there for $13. So I think we've got eight copies of that. There's a really, really helpful book. There's another book here called Just Do Something, A Liberating Approach to Finding God's Will, or How to Make Decisions Without Dreams or Visions or Fleeces or Impressions or Open Doors or Random Bible Verses or Casting Lots or Liver Shivers or Writing in the Sky. There you go. <laughs> That's another helpful book. Even better, the best thing best thing to do is to read the Bible. Get yourself a daily Bible reading guide because that's how God God guides us in life. Um, How about I pray uh, to finish up? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our great shepherd who guides us as your sheep. Um, Pray for any amongst us here today who may not yet be followers of the Lord Jesus, who are just making up their own way We pray that you'd help them to see that their own way won't lead to eternal life or to being like Christ. And uh, we pray, Lord, that you bring them to come and trust in Jesus. But for us who do want to follow your leading, we pray that you'd help us to come to your word and to listen to your voice and to what you say to us. And that as a church family, we kind of develop that spiritual muscle memory that we'd help each other to seek to your will for our lives to bring glory to your name. Amen.
Well, I hope that was helpful for you. Uh, Here at St Peter's, we consider ourselves to be God's dearly loved children. We're passionate for Him, and we desire for everyone to know Jesus and to grow in Him. And we have so many activities around that for toddlers, children, youth, uh, young adults, adults and more. Feel free to drop in any time at one of our gatherings at 8 a.m. as kind of more traditional service. 10 a.m. or 4 p.m. we have children's programs or 6 p.m. in the evening that's followed by dinner. You'd be more than welcome. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, we'd love to help you. We do a series called Hope and you can meet new people. Or if you'd like to join St. Peter's, uh, we have a special series called Belong which can help you find your feet. So let us know. You can text us on 0466 200 791. I'll repeat that for our radio listeners, 0466 200 791. Or you can use the QR code, which we'll leave up for the next minute or so. Enjoy your week.